So as academics, we, we write papers, hopefully to be published in academic journals, but also to affect the way that the world does business. And so it's hugely gratifying when practitioners take their time out to, to come out here and see the implications of research for the way investing takes place. And also the information flow is clearly not one way. We learn a lot from practitioners as to what are the important questions to, to work on. We're also disciplined in our thinking by what happens in the real world. So over the course of the next uh, 45 minutes or so, I'd like to ask just one question. And that one question is, why do businesses exist? What is the purpose of business? Is it to earn profit? Or is it to serve purpose? Is it to serve society? Do businesses exist for shareholders? or for stakeholders, for customers, employees, and the environment? Well, the conventional view is exclusively to earn profit. And there have been references this morning to Milton Friedman. He argued famously in 1970 that the social responsibility of business is to earn profit. And notice that that's not as narrow-minded as it sounds. Right, because to earn profit, a company is forced to care about society. It has to make high-quality products, or customers will stop buying. It has to treat its workers well, or they'll leave. And it can't pollute the environment, or the brand will be hurt. So according to Friedman, and this is a view that many people take seriously, we should just have one mission to focus on long-term profit, and with that clear goal in mind, that's going to force companies to care about society. So just head to the land of profit, and you're going to get all of those other decisions right. But that's only one view. And that's a view which works in theory, but it might not work in practice. Now, what Friedman would argue is that you would invest in your workers and you would reduce your emissions because you would calculate the fact that training your workers will ultimately lead to long-run profit. But in practice, it's impossible to reduce every decision to a mathematical calculation. Let's take Marks and Spencer, the UK high street store. Now, former chairman Simon Marks, he had a policy where all top executives had to walk around the shop floor to see firsthand how customers and workers were being treated. And one day, back in the 1930s, on one of his own visits, he sees a shop assistant faint. And he's concerned he wants to find out why. And it turns out that her husband is unemployed, and she is not work eating so that her family can. And so the very next week, Simon launches a policy to provide nutritious meals at nominal prices to all of his staff. Why does he do this? Well, Milton Friedman would say, do a calculation. Right? If I provide nutritious meals, this many workers will not faint, so I'm going to make this much more money. But there's no way of doing that calculation. Instead, Simon's thinking was simple. He thought, well, I'm going to provide nutritious me meals, even if it costs me money, because I care about my workers, and I want them to eat well. And because of having a reputation for treating its workers well, and also customers, Marks and Spencer's ultimately became profitable, but as a byproduct rather than as an end goal. And so this is a second view of business, which is not the profit-oriented firm, but the purpose-oriented firm. So it argues that companies exist not ultimately to earn profit, but to serve society, to make companies, uh, to make products that transform customers' lives for the better, to provide employees with a healthy and enriching workplace, and to preserve the environment for future generations even if you can't calculate the bottom line impact of doing so. But if you do that, profit may well end up flowing in the long term. Let's take another example. Let's take Merck. So George Merck, the president of Merck Pharmaceuticals, his mindset wasn't, how can I make as much money as possible selling pharma? But it was, how can I use science to save people's lives? Now, back in 1942, penicillin was still a new drug. It hadn't been made outside the lab before. It was too expensive. 
But George Merck takes a punt, and Merck becomes the first company ever to manufacture penicillin on large scale. Now, this is a photo of Ann Miller. She was a 33-year-old woman. She lived in New Haven, Connecticut. She was married to Ogden Miller, the Yale University Athletics Director. But on March the 14th, 1942, Anne lay dying in a hospital bed, stricken with streptococcal septicemia, which she'd suffered after a miscarriage. Her fever had hit 104 to 106 degrees for 11 straight days, and everything the doctors have tried had failed, until penicillin. Thanks to Merck, Anne becomes the first American ever to be treated with penicillin, and it saves her life. The very next day, her temperature is down to normal. She goes on to having three sons and lives until 90, day, 90 years old. And then what did Merck do after finding this amazing drug? Did it um, make lots of profits out of it? No, instead, George decided to give the secrets of making penicillin for free to his competitors, so that there was enough penicillin for the Allied troops in the Second World War. As George Merck said, we try never to forget that medicine is for the people. It is not for the profits. The profits follow, and if we have remembered that, they have always appeared. And this is the business case for purposeful business. It's not the business case at all. I haven't shown you any evidence that purposeful business works. All I've done is shown you two hand-picked case studies, two hand-picked anecdotes. And so to the academics in the audience who might be aghast that one of their colleagues in the profession is now showing photos and, and sort of storytelling, that was a straw man. So this is to highlight the dangers of case studies and anecdotes. We live in a world now where we have books and, and TED Talks and examples, but you can always find an example to support whatever you want it to support. Maybe I'm just a big advocate of social responsibility. I've mined all the companies, and I've found those two tales. And if I tell them convincingly, and it helps if you speak with them in a British accent, then people will remember, will be convinced about this, and think that this is true. And this is something which is very serious nowadays, because now, because data is freely available, you can find stories and they will be shared. At the moment in the UK, based on just three companies, BHS, Sports Direct, and Carillion, we're now undergoing a major change in corporate governance. We're now seeing investors and profits as evil and trying to rip up the current system based on these companies. And people will always quote these companies if they want to claim that the system is broken. So you might think, well, if anecdotes and case studies, that's not the solution. Well, isn't the solution then to look at large-scale evidence? Just gather a lot of data, and was alluded to earlier, we can have meta-studies which look at lots and lots of analyses. But again, and Laura mentioned this in one of our answers to the questions, this is not satisfactory either, right? Because you can have evidence which looks at hundreds of companies, but evidence can show whatever you want it to show. Right? One of the most dangerous phrases is research shows that. Research can show anything. Right? So if you are, if like I love red wine, I could find a study showing that red wine leads to longer life, and I can use this in order to confirm the lifestyle choice that I, that I choose to make. And again, this is something that you'll see a, a lot in policy making, is that you can always handpick a study to support what you'd like it to support. So at the moment, there's a, an inquiry into executive pay in the UK. Um, I was in the House of Commons testifying about this, and the t witness before me, they wanted to argue that high ratios of CEO pay to median worker pay were a bad thing. So they found a study showing that the higher the ratio, the worse the performance. What they did was they handpicked a half-finished working paper version of a study. The actual final version was published and found completely the opposite result.
Like, but this just goes to show how, um, how, um, how you can always find anything to show that you want it to show. And this is particularly a problem in something like social responsibility. I and many of the other academics and the practitioners in the audience would like to believe that social responsibility does pay off. And so we might, and I suffer from this uh, as much as anybody else, we might like to interpret studies as, as supporting this, but just notice that there's a lot of um, danger because it may well be that we're going for the le least rigorous evidence. So what I'm trying to do here is I wanted to move beyond those two case studies, which show you nothing, and try to look at the large-scale evidence for whether social responsibility does indeed pay off. So the first thing I need to look at is, well, how do I measure social responsibility? And again, because there's so many different measures available, you can look at climate change, you can look at employees, you can look at suppliers and communities, there is such a, a, a danger of data mining. I could look at hundreds and hundreds of measures of social responsibility, just find the two or three that happen to work, and publish them, and as Laura's mentioning, this publication bias will mean that they will be published and the others I, I could bury. So what I chose to look at, as Adair alluded to, was the importance of employee satisfaction, so how well a company treats its workers. So why did I choose to focus on workers rather than anything else? Right, there's many other dimensions I could look at. It's so for three reasons. First, there is a strong, what we call an a priori hypothesis for why worker welfare should lead, should be correlated with higher firm value. In a lot of companies nowadays, com workers are their strongest asset. Indeed, there's a lot of work in the organizational behavior literature, which I might allude to at the end, on the importance of, of employees. So they are material where some of the other dimensions of social responsibility, let's say Catholic values, they may not be material in every company. Number two is that I had data on employee satisfaction from 1984. So I had 28 years of data to make sure that what I found was not just a fluke, not just co confined to a particular time period. And this is also important because the SRI movement is quite new. So many of the measures that we have might not be there for long. And the third dimension is that the measure that I used was a uh, fundamental, a quite detailed measure. What I looked at, was the list of the 100 best companies to work for in America. So what this does is it surveys the workers themselves by asking 57 questions on various dimensions such as credibility, respect, fairness, and pride slash camaraderie. Why do I think this is a good measure? There's other things that you could look at in terms of, say, worker treatment. You might want to look at, say, um, the commitment to diversity by saying, well, do you have an ethnic minority or a, a female on the board of directors? But that's something which could be easy for a company to manipulate. It could be a company doesn't care at all about diversity, but puts a token minority on the board in order to check the box. Where something like this, you're fundamentally looking at the workers themselves, it's the ultimate in grassroots fundamental analysis. And as I say, they don't just ask, are you happy? They ask 57 questions which have been back tested and refined over the past 28 years. So what I want to do in this study is to look at, well, are companies that treat their workers well, do they indeed do better in the long term? Or are they just distracted from the bottom line? But there's multiple problems with that. Right, so if a company does is on this list and does well, how do I know that it's due to employee well-being? It could be due to many other factors. For example, Google is on this list, but Google was in the tech industry. The tech industry happened to do well, so it could be nothing to do with employee well-being. So what I need to do is for every company in this list, I have to control for what industry you're in. So compare Google not to the broader market, but other tech firms. But I have to control for many other things. For example, size, recent performance, and uh, growth opportunities, and a whole host of other factors. And as we know, correlation does not imply causation. Is it that employee satisfaction causes companies to do better? Or is it, once a company is doing well to begin with, it can start spending on employee satisfaction. 
Now, I am not able to rule that out in this paper. I do not have things like a natural experiment in order to achieve causal identification. I can do many things in order to try to, try to rebut the alternative hypothesis, some of which I'll, I'll come to later. So I can try to narrow down the competing explanations, but I cannot prove anything definitively. All I can do is shift our priors slightly towards the idea that actually employee satisfaction need not be at the expense of shareholder returns. OK, so it took uh, about four years to, to complete the study, to verify the robustness of the results, and to rule out as many alternative explanations as I could with the caveat that I can't rule out everything. And so what did I find? So I found that the 100 best companies to work for in America delivered stock returns that beat their peers by 2.3 to 3.8% per year over a 28-year period, which is 89 to 184% cumulative. So at least on this dimension, I know I stress it's this dimension alone. I have not proven that social responsibility pays off. I have shown that in America, one dimension of purpose does seem to be linked to superior performance. This is indeed one dimension which could potentially be used to uh, improve returns. And indeed, the Parnassus Endeavor Fund within the US, they do this. They used to be called the Parnassus Workplace Fund, um, but they changed their name because they don't just look at workplaces, they now look at fossil fuels. But over the um, 10 years since their in inception, uh, they've beaten their peers by the benchmark by about four percentage points per year. So what I want to do in the, the remaining um, half an hour, well, let's say 20 minutes to allow time for questions, is to talk about what does this mean for practitioners? Why should we care about this result? What can we take away? What can't we take away? And how do we put some of the ideas into practice? Now, you might think, well, isn't these results obvious, what I've just shown you? All I've shown you is that if companies treat their workers better, they do better. Well, that's sort of kind of obvious. Like, as a manager, you don't want to mistreat your workers. Um, it's clear that that's not going to be a good strategy. But what I want to stress is this is not as obvious as it sounds. Because treating your workers well is costly. Let's take Costco, for example. Costco, the US supermarket chain, they pay our work, their workers 90 per, um, sorry, $20 per hour, which is nearly double the national average of $11 at the time I did the study. And it gives 90% of their workers health care. And that's expensive. And indeed, this equity analyst quoted in Business Week said Costco's management is focused on employees to the detriment of shareholders. Why would I want to buy a stock that pays workers double what they need to. And this is indeed sometimes the conventional view that we have of companies. So we view companies as a fixed pie, and any slice of the pie that we give to workers is taken away from shareholders. I'm going to come back to this later in the talk, but I'm going to call this the pie-splitting mentality. This is the idea that to make profit, you need to work, reduce what you, you give to stakeholders. And notice that the pie-splitting mentality is not only possessed by some CEOs, it's also the view of, of some policymakers and of general society. The view is, is that, well, if we want to, to um, make businesses more uh, socially oriented, investors are the enemy. Like we want to have reduce profit, we want to put restraints on investors and reduce their voting rights. If they would only just have less profit, then they'd be more round to go for everybody else. And I think that's a very dangerous mentality, and, 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 and sadly, this is what is, what is uh, driving some policy, at least in the UK at the moment. Viewing the pie as fixed, and therefore workers and shareholders, or society and shareholders, they are seen to be enemies. And this is indeed the view, right? So management should be seen as trying to squeeze as much as possible out of their workers, just like a great football manager is one who squeezes as much as possible out of their players. You don't want to um, have players just walk off at the, pit at the end of the game happy. You want them to be sweating and, 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 and exhausted. That is often the view that people have of management. Now, before my current life of poverty, I actually had a job 
So um, I, I used to work at Morgan Stanley. Um, as you can see from the microwavable ready meals in the bottom corner, I was a junior analyst right at the bottom of, of the totem pole. And one day in the office, the vice president caught me laughing. And he said, Alex, you were not allowed to laugh in the office. And I asked him, why? And he said, well, if you are too happy, my boss, the managing director, will think I'm a bad vice president because I'm not working you hard enough. And again, this is back to the, the traditional view that what workers and, and shareholders are at the opposite of each other. So the way in which to make you more productive is to squeeze workers more. But indeed, what this evidence suggests, at least for the one dimension that I focus on, is actually this pie splitting mentality could be destructive. What we want is instead the pie growing mentality by investing in your workers and treating them better. What you're doing is you're increasing their slice of the pie, but not at the expense of shareholders, but, in, as a res but instead what you're doing is growing the overall pie to make both shareholders and workers better off. And again, the implications here are not just, well, management, you should invest in your stakeholders, but also how should society think about companies? One of the worst claims that you can make about a company is the company was profitable. Like you can say, well, Apple generated X million of profit every second, or this CEO earned uh, $10 million per year. But those things need not be at the expense of society if they are as a result of treating workers well and therefore having a productive workforce, then actually both workers and, society, uh, and shareholders do, do win together. And indeed, as Costco CFO Richard Galanti said, from day one, we've run the business with the philosophy that if we pay better than average, provide a good salary and good benefits, we'll be able to hire better people, they'll stay longer, and they'll be more efficient. Now, what I looked at is only one dimension of social responsibility or purpose, but there's other dimensions which at least seem to be correlated with superior outcomes, at least within their time periods. For example, what this looks at was the American Customer Satisfaction Index. This is in a top marketing journal. Now, you might also think that if you're treating your customers well, that's at the expense of shareholders, but this uh, paper suggests, well, at least there seems to be a positive correlation here. Or you can look at a, a, a measure of um, environmental stewardship. So this also won the Moskowitz Prize a few years ago, which looked at a measure of eco-efficiency, which is the value of a company's goods and services relative to the waste that it generates. And this is also said to be correlated with the superior long-run returns. Now, instead of, de of defining a dimension of stakeholders, workers, customers, or the environment, what you could also look at is the idea of putting in sustainability policies. So what these um, authors from LBS and HBS did in a top management journal was they looked at companies who in 1992 had voluntarily chosen to put in sustainability policies. For example, to have a chief sustainability officer, somebody at board level, responsible for sustainability. Now, the interesting thing here is that 1992 was before the SRI movement really took off. So this was before there was maybe public pressure or even investor pressure to do this. So companies didn't do this out of window dressing, but they were particularly forward thinking and thought, well, if we were to put some of these long-term dimensions in place, maybe this is going to be good for the company in the long term. And what they found, at least in the time period that they study, was companies with high sustainability beat companies with low sustainability by a significant margin. But that is only part of the picture. Those are only four studies to show you that certain measures of sustainability are linked to long-run returns. But there's also the other side, and Philip presented part of the other side this morning. But more generally, there was a debate in the Wall Street Journal, um, I think this was early 2017, does socially responsible investing make financial sense? There was a yes side. And there was a no side. And regardless of whether you are more inclined to the yes or, or the no, this is one where you'll, have, you'll see both sides of, of the argument. There are indeed some papers which show actually the opposite. But what I'm going to conclude from all of these results is not that every dimension of social responsibility is going to pay off in long-term returns. As was stressed earlier, one could be upfront about the fact that certain dimensions don't pay off. 
and yet investors should still be willing to invest in those dimensions because they have goals other than financial returns. Instead, what I'm going to stress is that there are certain dimensions which may well be correlated with long-term returns, and those particular dimensions which I'm going to look at as being pie-growing dimensions, companies that do invest in them, they're not donating to stakeholders at the expense of shareholders, but they're engaging in some investments which, for some reason, the market is not valuing today, and therefore those companies might be underpriced, and so they may be particularly uh, interesting investment criteria. So I'm going to focus the rest of the talk on those particular pie-growing dimensions, with a big caveat that not every dimension of social responsibility is going to lead to these positive outcomes, nor need it for us to be willing to invest in it. So I think what, uh, what, we are, what we look at here is if we indeed believe there's certain dimensions that are relevant, this does shift our thinking in terms of how we should pick stocks. So the traditional view is we pick stocks based on price earnings ratios and earnings of share and dividends. Those are things we can easily look up on, on Yahoo Finance. But because they're easy to look up, anybody can look them up, and they're, all, they're likely to be priced in. But in order for investors to be able to earn superior returns, you don't just want to find good companies. Good companies don't make good investments. A good investment is not a good company. It's a company which is better than what the market is currently being pricing in. And so this is potentially why looking at some of these SRI dimensions may have incremental value to investing, even though they should not be the only thing that you look at, they're still useful because there are certain dimensions that could be correlated with long-run performance and also not be priced in because some investors may have the pie-splitting mentality that these dimensions are at the expense of shareholder returns. Indeed, there are some increasingly other ways of trying to capture other dimensions of sustainability. So we have here like true cost and sustainalytics and asset for and Calvert, which look at various other sustainability dimensions. Now I've given various variations of this talk many times, and I've asked the audience, put your hand up if you can if you know of all four of these data sources. And I very rarely get any hands up at all. But that's precisely the point. Right? So these measures, even though they're quite well respected, by people who've evaluated them, most people haven't heard of them because they don't believe that these things add value. Now, I'm, what I'm not, again, not claiming is that you should invest purely based on this, but the idea that they have zero value at all is probably not going to be true. So to ha have this in addition to all of the traditional criteria that you might look at is likely to have incremental information and improve the investment decisions. The other thing I'd like to end before um, going, going into sort of the, the, pra the, the practical Im implementation within a company level is the idea that these things require long-term perspective. So any investment in stakeholders that costs money today, so the investment that Costco is making in paying its workers more, that hits the bottom line today. And if there indeed is a positive outcome, that's in many years' time because you've managed to retain the best workers and they're more motivated. But some investors may well have a, a much shorter horizon. What I found in my study was that it takes the stock market four to five years before it fully prices in the benefits of employee well-being. So the ironic thing is this best companies list is highly public. So if the market was efficient, as soon as this list was announced, the stock prices of the best company should jump, and you should see no returns going forward. But instead, what I find is very little reaction on the announcement day. And then over the next four to five years, you have positive drift. Even if you were to buy a company on the best companies list three years too late, you would still get superior returns for one or two years or so. The other thing I can look at is what happens when these companies announce their future earnings. So in the US, companies have to announce their earnings quarterly before they do so. Equity analysts will um, forecast what they think the earnings will be. 
and they'll use various criteria to forecast those earnings. And some of those things might be things like management quality, some of those emitted variables at the back of your minds which might be driving my results. Now, they should know a company's employee satisfaction. That is public information. They should use that information when forming the analyst forecasts. But what I find is they don't. Systematically, these best companies outperform the analyst's expectations, so they're doing better than what the market thinks, perhaps because the market has this idea of the equity analyst in Business Week that actually companies that treat their work as well, this is at the expense of long-term returns. So the importance here, and I'm going to return to this in the implementation, is on having a, a long-term perspective. So, um, and this is why, for example, Paul Pullman at Unilever, or, um, soon after he took over, he decided to stop issuing quarterly earnings because he said, well, this is going to allow him to focus more on the long term. It seems that the dimension of, employees, of um, employee satisfaction I focus on does lead to superior performance, but only in the long term. Okay, so now what I want to look at is how do we put this into practice? Not from the investor's standpoint, but from a company's standpoint. Even if companies do indeed want to think about growing the pie, focusing on the dimensions which improve value not only to investors, but also society, how can I do this? The first thing to focus on is excellence. Now, simply by doing, being excellent at what companies do, that has major impact on customers, employees, suppliers, the environment, and society, in addition to profits. And this sort of might seem obvious. You might think, well, shouldn't companies want to be excellent anyway? But actually, this is not how a lot of the narrative that I see. The narrative I see is, let's take Vodafone. Vodafone, the big telecoms operate in the UK. How are, do they serve society? Well, what people will point to in terms of Vodafone's biggest contribution to society was they were the first company to produce the tax transparency report showing the taxes they pay to governments worldwide. Or if a company cuts its carbon emissions, or if a company reduces its CEO to worker pay ratio, these are said to be things which champion society and are wildly applauded. I disagree with that. I think the best thing that Vodafone can do is to offer an excellent mobile service, and that creates far more value to society than cutting its carbon emissions, even though those things are also important. Let's take, for example, M-Pesa, which Vodafone launched in conjunction with the Department for International Development of the UK. That has transformed people's lives in Kenya by giving access to, to, to finance and banking. And there's some work by Tavnit Suri at uh, MIT just showing how that's lifted many families out of poverty. So the most socially destructive actions that a company can make is not errors of commission, doing something bad, such as paying your CEO too much, but errors of omission, not innovating. That indeed leads to much more destruction by failing to grow the pie, by failing to innovate, that destroys far more to society than actually paying a CEO too much or even uh, not, uh, even, uh, not reducing your, your climate change. And the implication for this is important. So excellence is the, is the best form of service. Not indeed things that necessarily make sacrifices. Something such as launching M-Pesa that can benefit both society and shareholders. It also means that almost all companies play a role in serving society. So often we think if we want to be an, an investor with a social mission, we should invest in something like pharmaceuticals. But even a company, let's say, Network Rail, they run the rail track within the UK. That has a huge role in society. By running a great rail business, what this means is this connects people to uh, jobs and allows them to live close to families and communities. And all of these things have huge positive impacts in society. It shouldn't be seen that Network Rail is any worse a contributor to society than a pharmaceuticals firm. It also means in terms of workers, all employees play a role in, within companies. So again, you might think within a pharmaceuticals firm, the people on the R&D team, they are on the front line and they're the people who are adding a lot of value. But the Treasury Department of Merck, which gives them low cost access to finance, that has an important role as well. So we shouldn't just see particular jobs or particular functions as being more important than others. And even almost all tasks for an employee. So clearly, the preparation that I put to teach in the class, that adds lots of value because that's outward facing. 
when I'm sitting in a meeting about how to restructure the MBA program, I might be bored and not put in any effort into that because that seems to be internal. But again, still something like that does have as, as much importance in terms of the overall um, offering that we're giving. So I myself need to know that I shouldn't want to focus on only excellence in a few sort of outward facing good PR type activities. Second dimension that um, we want to look at is the idea of purpose. So what I've just said is companies should be excellent, but excellence is far too broad to give a company direction. Right? Saying company should be excellent, well, excellent means something different from Merck and Marks and Spencer and Network Rail. So the idea of purpose is to try to scope out what does it mean for a particular company to be excellent. And the idea of purpose is a company's intrinsic reason for existing. So this is why a company exists, how it seeks to serve society, even if there were no profit impacts of it, and you'd see profit as the ultimate byproduct of serving a purpose. I started my career at Wharton, and um, one of my mentors was a guy called Andrew Metric, who talked about the idea, the purpose of, of a professor. It's not publishing papers that is a byproduct, but what he said was the purpose was the creation and dissemination of knowledge. And so we can think about a company's purpose as being analogous to the creation and dissemination of knowledge for a professor. Now let's look at some potential purposes. Now, there are books and TED Talks by the likes of Simon Sinek which talk about start with why and companies should think about why they exist. But I think almost as important is who a company exists for. Right, companies have multiple stakeholders, workers, suppliers, customers, the environment, and so on. And who is just as important as the why? Now, what some companies try to do is they try to say, well, our purpose is to serve customers, colleagues, suppliers, the environment, and communities while generating return to investors. That purpose statement is completely meaningless. Right, so this suggests that you're going to be all things to all people. That denies the existence of trade-offs when we've seen from the earlier today there are real trade-offs that are made in company decisions. Something like that doesn't mean anything. Now, having a purpose which focuses on the who, that is uncomfortable. Because what that does is that suggests that certain um, uh, stakeholders are more important than others. For example, Olam, this is an agrochemicals firm within Singapore. They endeavour to generate economic prosperity and contribute to social well-being. They're focusing a lot on the environment. John Lewis, a UK store, they choose to focus on employees. And so if there are particular trade-offs, then they might weight employees more than other stakeholders. I don't think this gives far more direction. So what I will say about a purpose statement is that a purpose is only meaningful if the converse would also be reasonable. Right? A purpose to serve all of these things is meaningless because no company would have a purpose to serve none of those stakeholders. But Olam's focus on the environment is meaningful because a different focus of focusing on your customers or focusing on your employees, that could also be reasonable. John Lewis's focus on employees is meaningful because you could also have a purpose of focusing on another stakeholder base. And in terms of the why also, how do you intend to serve the who, your stakeholder base? Again, there you should recognize trade-offs. So here, Costco, they've chosen to provide quality goods and services at the lowest possible price. Minimize price subject to a particular quality standard. Now, an alternative purpose is let's maximize quality subject to prices not being too high, but they've chosen not to do that. And so that is something which also I believe is to be meaningful. Now, clearly, pursuing a purpose is more than just a definition. It needs to be embedded internally and communicated externally. But the first thing which is going to be important is just to try to define it to begin with and to have uncomfortable trade-offs and say what you care about and what you care about a little less is uncomfortable but means much more than trying to be all things to all people. 
I want to leave enough uh, time for questions, so I'm not going to go through this last part. I'm just going to go through one aspect of internal embedment. And as the academics in the audience would have guessed, I'm going to talk about CEO compensation. OK, so one way in which um, it's important in order to get CEOs to think long term is to look at uh, their incentives. So often when I talk to companies about this, they'll say, well, the CEO, she gives this great speech about a purpose. But then people have doubts as to her commitment to it, not because the CEO is particularly duplicitous, but, but they know that the harsh reality is the CEO may be um, um, accountable to quarterly earnings targets or some particular bonus targets in a, in a pay scheme. Now, CEO pay is probably one of the most controversial dimensions of a company. If anybody ever wants to quote that companies are out of touch with reality, what they will quote is the level of pay. Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton agreed about virtually nothing. But the one thing they did agree on when they were um, campaigning was they said CEO pay was way too high in the US. Obviously, Donald Trump used a bit more aggressive language than Hillary Clinton, but there was at least agreement on this dimension. And if you look at some of the levels here, they just seem so high in the UK. Pay is £5 million. That is uh, about uh, 150 times what an average worker gets paid. So what they celebrate or commiserate in the UK is Fat Cat Wednesday, the 3rd of January, where a CEO has earned more in those two or three days than a worker has in the entire year. And that shows what people's view is about pay. Now, the idea is if a CEO didn't pay herself so much, there'd be more for everybody else to go round. But that is the pie-splitting mentality. That is the idea that the way a CEO contributes to society is to reduce her slice of the pie. But her slice of the pie is tiny. Five million is only 0.06% of the size of the average FTSE 100 firm of eight billion. Much more important is the horizon of pay. So if pay is incorrectly structured, that could lead to several percentage points of value being destroyed. So what I think the, sh the um, conversation should shift from is the level of pay to the horizon of pay. So if you're giving CEOs incentives for the long term, that will encourage them to make the pie growing investments, such as investing in your workers that we've touched upon. And in particular, if you do that, then by making those investments, she will generate value not only for investors, but also for society. So rather than trying to crack down on the level by wanting to do different things, but ch such as changing the vesting period of equity from, let's say, three years to five years, that will have a much larger impact on firm value than changing the level even though changing the level will win most headlines. I'm just going to give you one paper which looks at that. There's two here. I won't talk about my own then, because I've not got much time. Let's talk about this paper here. So what this paper looked at was the impact of what happens if a company was to implement long-term compensation, along the lines that I've said, equity that doesn't vest for many years. Now, the problem is that if a company chooses to implement long-term compensation, and then performance goes up, how do you know that it's the long-term compensation that improves performance? Long-term compensation doesn't arise randomly. It could be that an engaged investor, one of you, it had proposed this. And it's the engaged investor that leads to the superior performance. So what they do here is what's known as a regression discontinuity. What they do is they look at companies which had shareholder proposals to implement long-term compensation. And there are some proposals which pass with 51% of the vote, and some which fail with 49% of the vote. And whether you succeed or fail, 49 versus 51, that's sort of essentially random. Right? Because if there was a large in engaged investor, that investor is probably going to increase the um, vote from 49 to 70, not necessarily to, to, to 51%. And what they find is that if you put this in, this leads to an improvement in profitability only in the long term. It dips in the short term, but it improves in the long term. But interestingly, there's also some improvement in some of these other stakeholder societal dimensions, improvement in innovation, and improvement in various CSR measures um, by looking at the KLD scores, environment, customers, and society, and in particular employees, all of those measures uh, go up. And I think far more than just the specific finding of that paper, 
I think this shows the importance of the pie growing mentality. The best way in which we can encourage companies to serve society is to grow the pie for both investors and stakeholders alike by aligning them to long-term value rather than just lowering the pay or the pay ratio.